So hello, friends. Uh, welcome to our stress eating presentation. Before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to mention if you are getting UG wellness benefits, please message me again your full name in case you are using somebody else's login or if you have a kind of uh, encrypted name, so you will get your benefits. Also, if you have any quest questions during the presentation, please send them in the message board and I will we will ask them I will keep track of them and we will ask about them I will ask them at the end of the presentation so let me introduce Brooke now Brooke Sides is a functional nutrition practitioner who helps women holistically to get their group back using a system-based approach Brooke is certified board certified in holistic nutrition certified in functional medicine and is a master in counseling psychology degree candidate. Uh, the, the, this is what we uh, wrote as a summary or she wrote as a summary of the class. Too many people have developed a dependency on foods to deal, to deal with underlying issues such as stress, anger, or other extremes of emotion. Instead of learning how to recognize these sensations for what they are, we are now beca began to turn to food as a mean of uh, medicating these symptoms and emotionally eating statistics are on the rise. In this class, you will learn more strategies to begin to address emotional and stress eating to support health and longevity. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you, Magda. I'm really glad to be here. I know we have about 30 minutes to go through the class information. Um, there will be some time at the end for a Q&A if you have some questions. What I would just request from the beginning is if you think of something as we're going through the information, put your question in the chat box and I will circle back to that at the end and make sure I get all your questions answered. So can anybody this, this picture, the first thing Magda said was, oh, I haven't had that in many years. It looks good. <laughs> so I'm sure many of us can relate to um, cravings or turning towards food, sometimes at the end of a busy and long day um, or various other types of stress and emotional eating. We're gonna get into what that really is. Um, I find in practice in working with people that some people are very aware of their emotional eating. And other times we're doing it kind of unconsciously. So we're gonna talk about all places on the continuum of stress and emotional eating. And then we'll get into some strategies um, for that. I, the one thing I'll add on to what Magda shared about my background is that I also do somatic work with people. It's called somatic experiencing. And it is essentially a way, a way that we can, sorry, I had that a little, we can. Um, if you're not muted, would you mind muting? Cause I'm kind of hearing my voice back. Um, I think everyone is. And Magda, it wasn't happening with you and I. Okay, it went away. Um, it is a way of helping the body complete the stress cycle. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that means because oftentimes we're taught in life to cope with our stress, with our stressor. So we address the stressor and we sort of cognitively work our way through it. But when we have a flood of stress hormones in our body and we aren't physically able to finish the stress cycle, we're left with feelings of stress and anxiety. And we all have ways of dealing with that. And sometimes food is one way that we will self-soothe um, and try to soothe that physical stress. So I'll kind of circle back to that idea later. So I'm sure we've all been in that place where, um, you know, the day was crazy, work was nuts, we were slammed, or we had some family stuff come up, and we just think it's either a reward, right? Like, oh, I really deserve that, deserve that cake, cake, or, or um, uh, you know, just it's either a reward, or we actually kind of turn towards that to help ourselves relax, and so we see that. Um, coming up in different ways for different people to deal with our emotions. 27% of adults admit that they turn towards food uh, for to deal with stress. 
And we hear that voice and it could be that we're sort of familiar with this nagging voice of guilt in our heads that accompanies an excessive or indulgent meal. Um, but it's another thing entirely to heed that voice and figure out what else we're gonna do with that stress or that craving or that desire, right? It's much easier said than done. 34% um, of people admit to eating emotionally as a habit. So it's pretty common. So let's talk about what is actually happening in the body when we have this stress response. Now I'm gonna talk about two different types of stress. We can have mental emotional stress and we can have physical stress. We may not be so aware of physical stress in the body, what's happening with um, our gut health, right? So we could have something going on in our gut that causes us to crave sugar. At one point in my health journey, I would explain my desire for sugar like there's a monster in my body that wants sugar. And when I have a bite, it's like an addiction. I can't stop and I want more. So there is such thing as sugar and food addiction. Sometimes that's pre present for somebody. And we really have to find a way to shift what we're eating so that we stop getting those messages from the body, if that makes sense. So for me, it and for a lot of people, if there's sugar addiction, we it's kind of like alcohol. We have to, we can't usually say for an alcoholic, just go ahead and have one drink every once in a while, you'll be fine. Um, for somebody who has sugar addiction, we usually have to, have to work through getting the sugar out. And typically then they will get a lot of different messages from the body um, that they don't need that and they don't crave it in the same way. But if they do have it every once in a while, it's kind of like a slippery slope. And if you're resonating with what I'm saying, then you know this could be more something going on for you is yeah, like when I have sugar, I can't just have a cupcake and then not have a cupcake for weeks to come. You know, I have one and then I'm eating it for two weeks straight. So if that's the case, there could be that we have, what's happening is that we eat sugar and just like we see with sugar that it's similar to, we get the same dopamine response in the brain as we see with cocaine, heroin, alcohol. It's not as violent as it is with drugs, but we do get the same dopamine response. We get that part of the brain lighting up those receptors. And some people, who have less dopamine receptors will need more of the drug of the sugar to get the same response. And so those people are more prone towards sugar addiction. So I wanna throw that out early because there is some biochemical differences between everybody that could make someone more prone to having some stress eating or emotional eating and finding it hard to stop. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot of research on binge eating disorder and sugar addiction and I'm slowly seeing what's out there in the literature, but I do, there are connections between binge eating and sugar addiction. We've got that, you know, in the science and there's some initial studies into using low carb eating for bit for cases of binge eating disorder and sugar addiction. And it's works fairly well. There's some pretty good outcomes. So getting the sugar and the processed food out is helpful when that's the case. If it's more that we're triggered by our emotions, so this would be where you notice, you know, yeah, every time I go kind of eat things that are less healthy or think, or I just start eating and um, I may be not hungry, it starts because I had a bad day, you know, or I'm feeling kind of down or I'm feeling kind of anxious. And then we might start to think that the trigger is stress. So let's first talk about what's happening in the body when we have a stress response. And I'm going to go back to initially what we were, you know, evolved to run from the tiger, right? To run from predators and survive. And so we see that threat in our brain. We, we um, take in information that there's a threat. And when that happens, our stress hormones start to go up. Our cortisol goes up. Um, first our adrenaline goes up, then our cortisol goes up. Um, we get a flood of these hormones through the body. Uh, our blood pressure is going to go up in order to, to, um, start pumping blood out to our extremities so that we can run. And we're either going to run until we get away, or we're going to run and hide. And if that gets too intense, we might freeze. And we see that if you watch videos of animals in the wild, right? That 
the the lions chasing the the elk or I don't know a deer and I can't remember what animals are in the same um, environment and and it grabs it and that animal that uh, prey falls over and plays dead right because it's its best means of survival at that moment and then the lion goes off to get its cubs because it thinks it's got its dinner and then when that that prey then once it's clear gets up and shakes violently shakes off all that physical stress and goes on its way and that's a completed stress cycle for that animal in life in society and because we're humans and we have this higher level thinking oftentimes what happens is we we don't really get to fully finish the stress cycle we don't fully get to run away or hide and then shake and move on right we we sort of do what is also important to survive like we don't punch our boss back in the face because we didn't like what they said. Um, you know, we just bite down our jaw. We don't say what we want to say and we kind of hold on to it. And then at the end of the day, we're left with this, these, all these stress hormones went up, all this uh, physical response happened and we might've finished the stress sore, but we didn't finish the stress itself. We're sort of stuck with it. So we go home or on the way home, we see the sign for McDonald's or whatever. And it's like, oh yeah, that looks like I kind of deserve that today or, um, or that might make me feel better. That might be sort of self-soothing. And so then we might turn towards food to deal with that stress. So that's called what we call the fight or flight response. Um, it, when, I, when I say complete the stress cycle, it means that we are shifting from fight or flight, which is our sympathetic nervous system, back into our parasympathetic, which is where, where you are when you get a good hug that's so good that you're done with the hug and you feel relaxed, you're with good friends, you're laughing, you're about to drift off into sleep, or you're at your computer and you're sort of settled, but you're real focused, you can think well, make decisions. That's when we're in our relaxed part of our nervous system. <clears throat> um, when we, we do Oftentimes when we eat, and especially when we eat sugar and carbs and sometimes fats, we will get the full, you know, we might get uh, dopamine. And when we eat sugar, we get a little bit of a serotonin response. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that makes us feel happy. And so we do get a response from those foods, but over time it can cause dysregulation in different systems in the body, in our blood sugar, in our mood, over time, it can it can kind of mess up those neurotransmitter systems, um, and cause more mood issues. But in the short term, it is a quick fix sort of a thing. So that's another reason we might decide to eat. So one thing, just to start to talk about, what do we what do we do with this? And feel free, you know, you don't have to share, but. It's always fun to share if you would like in the uh, chat box. I'm just glancing at it now. I'll try to periodically kind of check into here. I see a comment about um, what sugar is. This is a good moment for that. So what is sugar? And any carbohydrate will turn into sugar in the body, whether it be sweet potatoes or bread or um, fruit, or processed white sugar, but oftentimes we need some carbohydrate. And so even though it all turns into sugar, when I talk about um, sugar as causing an increase in dopamine and a fast increase in serotonin, I'm talking about simple sugars, which would be your processed um, added, what I would refer to as added sugars. So not the naturally occurring sugars that we get in plain yogurt or sweet potatoes or, um, fruit. I'm talking about things like the syrup that gets put in the Starbucks coffee or the donut. Um, yes to bread. If it's, if it's refined flour bread, it turns into sugar pretty quickly. If you have sprouted green bread, that is um, slower and that's got more fiber in it and things that would slow down that turning into sugar. So we have both with sugar wanting to have a slow release into the bloodstream of whatever we're eating and also just not have too much overall. And I see another comment here about food addiction until two years ago and then decided to take control and now you're a health and wellness coach. How cool, thank you for sharing that, Bridget. 
<clears throat> so yeah, that is a real thing. And one thing I'll throw into on what led me into nutrition and um, eventually now counseling is having binge eating disorder, um, having issues for way too long that were both rooted in my gut. So once I went through a functional medicine process and I will share what functional medicine is at the end and, um, and also worked through my reasons, my mental emotional reasons for turning towards food as a coping mechanism. Um, you know, that is totally in the past. It's still something, you know, you're never past, uh, if you have food addiction, just like alcoholism, you're never really not going to be triggered by eating too much of that food typically. So I avoid sugar all the time, uh, but it is something that you can manage and occasionally still have, you know, you'll, there's a lot of mechanisms, which will, or I should say techniques we'll talk about to help manage that. Emotional transparency. So we want to typically walk into the discomfort a little bit. Food can be an avoidant technique you know, a way of avoiding what's actually going on in our emotions and in our feelings and in our hunger. So first of all, the first simple question is, are we really hungry? You know, that's when people say, you know, I've got this habit of just always walking into the kitchen. I just find myself in there, you know, or stopping by somewhere on the way home is that if it's happening at the end of the day, can we before we get in the car and drive, if we tend to stop somewhere on the way home, can we get in the car and take a few moments to get mindful and present? What's happening in my thoughts right now? What's happening in my body? What's happening with my breath? Because if we can get present, then maybe we can have a little bit of transparency with our experience at the end of the day. Yeah, my heart's racing, I feel tense in my chest, I can't stop, like my mind is still going 100 miles a minute. Okay, so then we can add in some sort of intervention before we actually even start the car, like three minutes of breathing. There's breathing apps that you can put on your phone and it doesn't have to take long. There are studies looking at doing four, seven, eight breath for three minutes. And that type of breath can shift you from your sympathetic into your parasympathetic nervous system, which is that restful place in the nervous system in just three minutes. And that's just inhaling for four, holding for seven and exhaling for eight. And just doing that breath when we find ourselves feeling stressed out or thinking about food, we may still go get the food, but it's the beginning of at least starting to shift us into our relaxation response because Here's the big takeaway, if there's anything you take away today. When we're in stress, our prefrontal cortex, which is where we make decisions. So if we wanna choose a healthy meal over grabbing whatever's there because we're stressed out, we're not gonna be able to do it if we're not using our prefrontal cortex because then we've shifted into our emotional brain and we have automatic responses happening. And so we've got to find a way to get ourselves calm. And that's a really good first step. And I will have people do that breath, the four, seven, eight breath, or I also call it three Ps, which is presence, uh, per presence, perception, and perspective. So presence is just that moment of mindfulness. What's happening for me in my thoughts um, where am I in the space? You know, like what's going on for me right now? What do I feel in my body? What am I thinking about? Let me just kind of focus on that for a moment. Just getting present. Perception, and, and we can do that too if the body feels really uncomfortable and our thoughts are going a mile a minute, we can actually just focus on the space around us. Um, when my kids start melting down, I have little ones. The first thing I do is just, can you come outside with me? Let's just go outside. As soon as you walk out of the house, oh, there's the sky and the trees. Like there's there's more that we can get present with. We just start, and it's nature, so it's more relaxing. Then we can try to address what's happening, but it's gonna ultimately get us more present right from the start. Then we can have perception. Like, what? How do I perceive what's happening? Because that perception. Have you ever had the same thing happen two different weeks, and one week it's highly stressful, and the other week you're like, huh, 
I'm really calm about this. <laughs> How's that happening? That's just because you're having a different perception about the same stressor because there's different things going on. Or maybe you found a different way to think about it. You're perceiving it differently. And our perception has to do with what else happens in the stress response in our body. And then our um, perspective is, will I care about this in three months? Will I care about this in six months? Will I care about this in a few years? And sometimes it's yes, but often it's no, this is, this is just something happening right now. Um, so what can I do about it? And then we might be able to shift into that four, seven, eight breath or something. And we can go through that pretty quickly, just that thinking process, and then do something to get um, the body to calm a little bit. So that is getting kind of transparent with everything going on. Uh, mindfully eating would be a part of this too, when we actually do sit down to eat, or when we think I'm going to go eat, to really have a check-in, like, Notice what it feels like in your belly. Like, am I, am I really hungry right now? Or am I feeling some anxiety? You know, what is it that's going on? Is it true hunger? And when we do eat to really notice, use your sense, your senses and notice the sensations of eating. Um, sometimes we do this fun thing at the table with my kids where we eat in slow motion, you know, and they're little. So they think that's like a fun game. Like how slow can I bring the fork to my mouth? And then how slow can I chew? A lot of times if you slow it down, cause life is fast, even right now, um, if we're not out in the world as much, there's still so much information that can come at us through our phones and computers and TVs. So slowing down, noticing what it feels like, what it tastes like, chewing a little bit longer. We may notice we get fuller faster in that we feel more uh, satiated earlier because we're actually tasting what we're eating. Sometimes we go through it so fast, we're not really tasting it. I mentioned that gut health can play a role with food addiction. Um, there's also something called the, the gut brain axis or the gut, you know, there's a lot of different ways we talk about this, but basically it's this knowledge that our microbiome and all the bacteria in our gut informs what's happening. We make more than 95% of our serotonin, that feel good neurotransmitter in the gut. So if we're feeling mood issues, we're feeling um, low or anxiety, that can be initiated in the gut. So addressing gut health is very important for our stress response and our mood and our ability to focus and all of that. So we can also, um, you know, I won't get into gut health on this um, short talk, but that's something that could at least plant a seed to read a little bit more about that or, or do a class around gut health. If, if you're interested in learning more about how that can affect the brain and mood and emotion regulation. Uh, I asked a group of people this week, what is the biggest thing that throws you off track? Like if you have a health plan or a healthy habit, what's the biggest thing that knocks you off? And I got varied answers. Some people said stress, you know, or emotions. Um, but a, a, hand, a good portion of the group said, if I don't track my food, like if I don't pay attention to what I'm eating and I don't plan it out and I don't have the food available. So these are also big strategies. Like if you always find that you're hungry at a certain time in the day and that's when you get thrown off, make sure you have snacks there, you know, healthy snacks. Um, or you know what you're gonna to get to eat. Maybe writing it down. If, if I ask you right now, what did you have to eat yesterday? What in detail, what did you eat yesterday? I bet some of you know exactly. And I bet there's some people here who can't remember. And so if you can't remember, then you might be someone that would benefit from a food diary, um, actually writing down what you're eating. And it's kind of interesting too, to write down how you're feeling or when you have cravings, because you may notice some connections between foods triggering cravings. You can say, I had a craving at 3 p.m. I really wanted a candy bar. And then you go back and look at what you had for lunch and you may see like, oh, that day that I had, you know, the, the broccoli with chicken, I didn't have cravings later, but that day that I had pizza for lunch, I did, you know, so it might help you kind of figure out what's working best in your body.
And then in this, we're just talking about um, looking at our lifestyle. So I've talked uh, quite a bit about this as far as regulating stress and emotions. Um, are we exercising? Are we connecting with community? And that's hard right now. You know, a lot of people are noticing more loneliness um, and more in, in the greater levels of isolation. So how are we connecting with people and getting some social connection? How are, are we exercising? Are we moving our body? That's one way to complete the stress cycle at the end of the day is just move your body. So whatever sort of movement or exercise you like to do, that is that can help with that. Sleep, are we going to bed at a decent hour and getting seven to nine hours of sleep a night? One poor night of sleep can cause insulin resistance the next day. And when we have some insulin resistance, we will typically crave more sugar. So if we're not getting enough sleep or good sleep, that's a big thing to consider too. Uh, body image can lead to, you know, different choices that we make around food. And so that's also something to consider. And, and there's, we don't have a whole lot of time to go into that, but there's a lot of things that we get, can do to improve body image. I think um, mindfulness and things like yoga and other, other types of um, getting present in our body and mindful and breath work. And then a lot of other, you know, cognitive type of approaches can help with body image. And I, I taught, I already spoke about triggers, um, but some, if there's food triggers, those may be things we want to first say, well, yeah, I'm going to replace this with that. So we find some swaps or some substitutes for some of the things that trigger us to kind of eat more of, of them. So start with a plan, you know, planning to have some healthy options around or some choices that are better than other choices you might be confronted with. Um, oftentimes, if we get hungry and we don't have the right things around, that's going to be an issue for most of us. I mentioned the mindfulness and stress management, um, getting out in nature, exercising, and we live in a culture of all or nothing. So that's where that balance and not perfection, right? Starting with it, it's all the little things that add up to health. So we can start with something really, really small. And it can make a really big difference because once we accomplish that, we're successful and we build some self-efficacy and then we can try the next thing. And so knowing that if you go into the holidays and you have a day where you eat a bunch of stuff that you don't want to eat, it's all right. It's just one day and we can get back into healthy habits with the next meal or the next bite of food. Um, feel free to share in the chat box. Uh, I know I'm going through some of this information um, fairly quickly, just hoping you walk away with some new thoughts or tips and ideas. Uh, if you have anything to share on this, feel free. Oops. And then I wanted to quickly, before we wrap up, excuse me, <coughs> my throat is dry, share a little bit on what functional medicine is. Many people don't know what that means, but it's becoming, there's more and more places starting to add functional medicine as an option. It is a systems-based approach to identifying and addressing the root causes for your symptoms, as opposed to more conventional Western medicine approaches, which are symptoms-based. So you go in with some symptoms and there's usually a treatment for those symptoms. Um, and what we know is that there's all these systems in our body, our cardiovascular system, our digestive system. And those are, when those are out of balance, we're gonna get symptoms eventually. Those symptoms may look the same between two different people, but the root causes are different. And so in functional medicine, we're looking for what those actual root causes are and then laying out uh, plans that are usually lifestyle dietary interventions um, are the foundation. Uh, if somebody's a physician, they may use a medication, but we're definitely using diet and lifestyle to address those. Um, if you're interested in learning more about functional medicine, you can go to the Institute for Functional Medicine. It's ifm.org, and you can get all kinds of great videos and information to learn more about that. Um, I will just share a little bit real quick. I know we're hitting 1230. Um, <clears throat> My uh, private practice is called Wired and Tired Women. Um, I always say I also work with men. It's just Wired and Tired Men doesn't um, sound as good. 
and uh, my office is in Prairie Village. And so I'm a, a board, you know, board certified in holistic nutrition. I do um, functional lab work as well. So I um, typically a lot of people come to me because of stress and fatigue and hormone issues and gut issues. Those are the biggest things I work with. Um, I do a 30 minute complimentary appointment for new clients. So if you're, um, you know, just have some questions, I'm always happy to answer. And sometimes if it's somebody else you need, I know a lot of the providers in the area and I'm happy to refer you. I also work for a program that's north of the river um, called Premier Integrative Health. And they, um, and that's more of a six month program for people who have, want kind of a full, you know, uh, practice that they're a part of for six months. So those are a couple options out in the area. There's lots of them and happy to share more info if you'd like. I also do somatic experiencing, which as I mentioned earlier, and that is if stress is a big factor um, for you, you can learn more about that at traumahealing.org. And that's something that I do via Zoom or in office as well. Um, and I'm just always happy. I love educating and letting people know that there's all these different therapeutic approaches out there and you can, uh, I'm, so I'm just happy to share info on them too. If you ever want to reach out, I don't think I put my, I'll throw my uh, contact info here in the chat box in case you have any questions or want to reach out. Um, my website is just wiredandtiredwomen.com and my email is brooke at wiredandtiredwomen.com. So feel free to reach out if you have questions. If you have to go, if you've hit the 30 minute mark, I'm so glad you were here. And uh, I hope that you got some things that you can take with you and help you in your health journey. If you'd like to stay, we'd, uh, we have, I'm, I'm here for another 15 minutes or so. So go ahead and post your questions in the chat box. Um, yes, uh, Bridget, I'm definitely interested. I'd love to. Good, that's and, great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go back up here and see if I can answer some of these questions. Okay, so there was, Magda, did I get the question answered on, on gut in, imbalances? I can talk more about that if you want. It would be helpful because, or like maybe vagus nerve, vagus nerve yes 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 so our vagus nerve runs from our brain all the way down and it um we get uh, it's going to innervate and we're going to get messages between that nerve and our gut and that bacteria for years we ignored the bacteria in our gut and um now we understand there's actually research showing how certain things can form in the gut or types of bacteria can travel up the vagal nerve into the brain. And actually um, we can end up with more amyloid plaque, which is found in Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's a connection with Parkinson's. So we're starting to see research on how the bacteria and the microbiome through the nervous system, through the vagal nerve can actually impact the brain in pretty significant ways. And it happens over a very long period of time. Um, so I always say that because I don't want to cause anyone to get, oh my goodness, what do I do? I, I don't want to have, you know, brain issues as I age. There's so much we can do um, to, to because this is a process of 20 or 30 years, usually that these things happen, to start addressing our health. And we can do that by starting by looking at the gut. And there are a lot of undiagnosed dysfunctions, because in Western approaches, we're looking for diagnosable, we're looking for disease. You know, so people that work in conventional medicine are looking for disease, which is really important when it's there and when we need a surgery or a, a medication intervention. But for health, we want to get on top of dysfunction also, because it's that dysfunction that causes chronic disease over the long term. And what I mean by that is an example in patients with IBS, 82 to 87 percent of them, depending on what study you look at, have SIBO. SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. SIBO can be triggered by stress. It can be triggered by abdominal surgery. It can be triggered by a handful of things that a lot of people have experienced, like stress. And so if we have stress that's damaged the motility, that's caused 
a bacteria to go up into the small intestine overgrow. And now it's fermenting the stuff we eat and causing all this bloating and gas. Then we go to the doctor and they say, yeah, you've got IBS. We can actually address the bacterial overgrowth in functional nutrition or functional medicine. And we can work on the stress and the lifestyle and all the other factors that are the root causes for that. And in turn, we might start making more serotonin, right? That neurotransmitter that makes us feel good. We, we will have, if we're working on stress, we're not gonna have those messages that are sent, that our vagal nerve and all our nerve endings in the gut are picking up on and we're getting this anxiety and this stress response all the time that's affecting our gut. So I could kind of go one way or another, right? It's all connected. And when we look at it from this holistic perspective, we both help brain function by helping the gut and we help the gut by working on stress and helping our brain, right? Does that make sense? It's pretty powerful. It is I have a question. how it works, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always think back if I'd never found functional medicine in my twenties, like what a mess I would be by this year at age 40 because I was not headed on a good road. I was out of control with my two. I was too. <laughs> yeah, you understand. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there's a question here. I'm worried I have no self-control that I'm going to become diabetic. How do you get better self-control? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, um, you know, with, I would say kind of a longer answer, but a big part of that, the reason I went into doing somatic experiencing is that it helps people learn control over how their emotions are affecting the sensations in their body, which are affecting their, the images and the things they think about, which are affecting their behavior. And so somatic experience really works on becoming really present with what's happening in the body. And we call it getting out of the trauma vortex and into the, um, the counter vortex, which is like, you can just imagine that as the place you are when you're like, I'm calm, I'm in control, I can make choices. And that's essentially what we work on in there. It's not the only way to work on that. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, CBT type of strategies. I don't know, Bridget, if you wanna throw anything in on that, um, cause it's a, it's a big question. My thing would be start tracking. <laughs> that would definitely help track in better sleep, less carbs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those are great places to start, I think, too. Um, and yeah, then there was another comment. You won't have the cravings. Yeah. Once you get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Tracking is great. And I often recommend starting to track without judgment or making changes at first. So just start getting mindful, like just start tracking. Sometimes it's easier to start when you don't have all the other layers of like, oh, I need to change this. And oh, I'm not doing a good job. Like if we can take all that away and just say, it is what it is. Let me just see what I'm doing, right? like looking at it from the outside in and just writing it all down or putting it all in a tracking device. And then you can start going from one there. One thing at a time, yeah. Change yeah. One thing at a time. Because mm -hmm. you aren't gonna change your whole, everything, you know, at once. Just, it's a slow process. It took you a while to get that way. It takes you a while to get back. Yeah. And I don't know what your favorite is. I just put this in the chat box. I like um, Chronometer is a one app that you can track with my fitness pal. There's others, there's lots of them, but those are two suggestions if you want to put an app on your phone to track your food. Yeah, I think that's my fitness pal, but yeah, they're all good, even if it's a piece of paper and a pencil. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any other, I think I hit all the questions in here. Are there any other ones, anybody that popped up for anybody? Would you repeat the uh, name of the other app? 
Yeah. Um, so the one was my fitness pal and then chronometer. And if you click the, the chat box button, it may be when you go to your zoom bar, if you click more and then you click chat, um, that'll usually come up, but I'll spell it for you. If you can't see that it's mm -hmm. C R O N O M E T E R. Oops, I just realized I put it to Mag to Magda, not everybody. So no wonder you can't see it. Let me do that again. There we go. Um, and I did my my contact info that way too. So I'll put that back in. Look at wiredandtiredwomen.com. Um, I actually I should say this too that I. I try to get blogs out whenever I can and make them very, you know, get a lot of education in there. So if you go to that website um, and you go to the blog, and I think it's what comes up just as the main page, you'll see articles that I've written on gut health that go a lot more in depth than what we had time for today. I've got a four part series on hormone balance. So, you know, if hormones are a concern. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, I try that would to be talk. nice. Yeah. Yeah. To think what else is on there um strategies for sleep you know there's a variety of things i my goal is in the next month to get out some information on burnout because i think i'm hearing a lot from people on just burnout and kind of fatigue and low energy this with everything that's happened this year and knowing we're kind of headed into it getting a little a little more difficult for a while and we're not out of it so um it's gonna be a while <laughs> yeah yeah um it always helps me to write those because it reminds me to do everything too <laughs> so i'll get some of that out any other questions or comments well i'm already hearing comments how people want you back I hear people couldn't, uh, a lot of people were disappointed they couldn't take lunch break at noon. So maybe we could repeat this again in the spring or maybe something, you know, some other uh, 30 minute presentations if you would them have available, we'll have them available. I think there would be an interest for it. Sure. I would love that. Oh, there, I didn't realize I had one more slide if anyone means that. Yeah, I would be happy to come back. I always love classes. So I'd love to. Um, there is, I put this on there. If anybody uses social media, I also put shorter posts out on that Instagram handle. Um, it, just tips and things. I, I'm, I've got immune support front of mind. So I'm going to try to start getting some more just tips on supporting the immune system out on there too, over this next few months. I'm going to find it right now. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Bridget. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. This is a very important topic many people are not aware of because I was searching in this area myself and everybody was focused on anorexia because it could be life-threatening. And I really, for years and years, I didn't hear, didn't have any answers, you know? So I, I hope everybody found it helpful as well and have a happy Thanksgiving and see you around friends. Take care. <laughs>